And on top of it, your dad is also making mistakes on his post, on his job, basically. And I, we also know that he's connected to you. So we think that they, they shouldn't talk to you anymore. And if you say anything to them, you're going to get declared a suppressive person. All right. Today, we are joined by Catherine Spilino. There Did you I go. say it right? That's I got great. it. <laughs> Catherine, you grew up in the Church of Scientology, but even more specifically in the Sea Org, which is a specialized part of Scientology. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah. Um, I would say the most inner part of Scientology can be the most inside, the nucleus. <laughs> okay. Well, just for everybody who's not familiar, what exactly is the Sea Org? From what I understood, it was when L. Ron Hubbard was running from paying bills that everybody lived on a ship with him and and did activity. So am I completely off my rocker or is it something in that line? That's definitely the beginning of it. And he had them all sign billion year contracts because Scientologists and people who believed in L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology believe that you live many, many lives. So they were so dedicated, they de dedicated a billion years to work in the Sea Org, which was disseminating Scientology and doing all the tasks to keep Scientology out there in the world and the religion uh, working. So um, anybody who joined meant like that's that was their life. And then if you had children in it, which I was a child, you dedicated my life basically, or my parents dedicated my life as well. Does that answer any questions? <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, it, um, it's nice that you had choices in your life early. <laughs> Not. <laughs> yeah. But I, I am curious about that. I, I have interviewed another person who grew up in a church, uh, Christine Babin. She was in The Children of God. I feel like the perspective of somebody who's never known life outside of Scientology, you know, growing up into it is going to be different than somebody who converts in. Now, were your parents oh, also children of Scientologists? No. So um, it's a great question. Um, first off, thanks for having me on the show, too. Um, I wrote a book about this growing up in the Church of Scientology C organization. And at the beginning, can I read the preface? It just says like that quick, like how sure. my parents are in it kind of and um, myself. So it says preface. We are not. Oh, I'm actually going to read the forward. I'm sorry. Wrong words. Forward. A midwife delivered me in a small room in an eight-story apartment building on Hollywood Boulevard. The luminescent bright green Scientology sign outside my window reflected off the Hollywood stars that line the sidewalk below. I was a Sea Org baby. My parents had dedicated their lives to the Church of Scientology and its Sea Org, and in doing so, dedicated my life as well. Instead of being raised by my parents, my brothers and sister and I were trained among a couple hundred other Sea Org children to be the future leaders of Scientology. I was a cadet and I was going to help save the planet. If only I could follow the rules. So just to set it up, I, my parents did not, were not born in the Sea Org. It was the original question. And there was a, uh, they, my dad was in New York. My mom was in New York and they fell into Scientology through the normal way of like somebody's on the street. Hey, like, do you have anything that you want help with in your life? And both of them got into it. My mom met a friend on the subway who had the book Dianetics, which was the precursor to Scientology. And um, that pulled my mom in. She loved it. So then they both happened to meet. And then they had my brothers and my sister in New York and had joined the Sea Org and so then moved to Los Angeles. So when I'm born in Hollywood Boulevard in this building, it has a huge Scientology sign. It's kind of famous. Um, they like from the moment I'm, I've arrived or start understanding words, Scientology, I'll learn hover. That's all around me. And that's like all I know. Um, and I don't know really why my parents had joined growing up. I didn't understand or think to ask until I was an adult. And as an adult, my mom's answer was she, um, had freedom of thought was literally her answer. She said she felt like she could make choices and be a strong, independent person. And to me, that's funny because I don't think that's the case. Um, and then I don't think I ever asked my dad. 
Okay, so let's back up in time because I'm I'm very curious. You're born with a, a midwife. Now, um, were you with your parents at all as an infant? I mean, how, how did you eat? How did you, how were you cared for before you were, was that, were you with your parents before you were separated or how does that work? Yeah. So the first 12 weeks, my mom did nurse me. And then after that, I was put in a nursery with other babies that were my around my age. And they had a Sea Org member, somebody who worked for the church or several Sea Org members, watch the babies. So it's like daycare. So that would happen. But then I would still go to my parents at night. But around five or six years old, they put us all in dormitories. And we lived in LA still in a building called the Anthony Building on Fountain Avenue. And there were about six to eight dorms just packed with children. And each room had a dorm mom. And now we did not go to our parents. So we didn't see our parents until the weekends. And this is at six. And that was not even the whole weekend. We would see them for about two hours on this on a Sunday morning. Um, and that was when they actually had time to do their chores. So we would see them and the, what we would be doing is like helping them do their laundry or cleaning their room with them. So it wasn't really quality family time. And that was until I was eight years old. And then I was told I was going to a special place called the ranch. And now I had well, older siblings. <laughs> Yes. I want to. I. I no. I. I don't want. Yeah. I want to get in the weeds. I because yeah. the details are interesting. Yeah. How How did they introduce this to you? I mean, as a comparison, which is extremely light. When I was seven, Christmas got taken away from me, and I. I'm still. I still feel effects to this day, mm -hmm. because every year before that, I had Christmas, and then I didn't. You literally had parents. And we're going to a daycare and then all of a sudden you don't. So how, how did they introduce that to you? How did they explain that to you? Do you remember that? I actually don't. And it was never a big deal to me. Like it was normal. That's how it felt. So it could have been, I was four. I'm just, my earliest memories of the dorms are when mm -hmm. I was about six years old. Um, so I could have been even younger than that when we were already not seeing my parents. Cause to me it was normal and it was never like a loss. Um, and I would just be excited to see my mom. My mom actually happened to be a dorm mom herself, but to a different set of kids. So I would get to see her in glimpses throughout the day. And I would be like, oh, there's my mom. Hi, mom. And like, you know, just go about my day. It was um, normal to me. And I didn't think anything of it. Well, you're a mother now. So I'm mm -hmm. curious, um, you know, who would give you affection? Who would care for you if you fell? Who, who were your who's your family? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And um, I think what I did in my book is try to capture that world and like how it's not like I'm looking back now and being like, what the heck? How mm. come nobody was there for me? I'm like, in that viewpoint of a six year old, seven year old, eight year old as I grow in age. And at mm -hmm. first, it's normal. And I have my friends and my friends and I are extremely close. And even to this day, we are like, sisters and brothers like it's we're I think we kind of nurtured each other in a way as best as we could but we're also children and we shouldn't be doing that um so I think what the reaction I get from people when they read the book is they are just so um surprised at the neglect we experienced um and but meanwhile little me is totally like oh this is like fine this is great we're gonna save the world because mm -hmm. that's what we think we're doing and because I don't know any different. Sure. Yeah. You have no, no, you have no basis of comparison, um, exactly. but you do now. And that's why I was, you know, comparing and like, mm -hmm. as you were raising your children, is that helping you to see differences in how oh, yeah. you were raised versus how you're raising your own children now? Yeah, for sure. And it's very, um, I, it's sad. Like you go, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like who was there to watch my first steps? Did anyone care? You know, there's so many milestones, especially that first year when you're a baby. And I'm like, was I just in a cot, like crying? Like, I don't know. Like, that's a little sad. To, it's really sad to think about. And um, I, I'm like, grateful that I get to raise my children and be with them and help them every step of the way. I'm actually stay, stay at home mom. So I'm very involved in their lives. And I, and I enjoy every aspect of it because I'm like, to me, it's wild that no, that I didn't get to experience that. And I didn't even know. And I, um, 
I don't know how my mom thought that was okay, but she did. Well, and we'll get into that, but I'm curious too about affection because there have been children who were in orphanages and they've actually done some studies on them where they did not get really good or affection or care. And that caused them problems throughout their life in their ability to be affectionate with others in communication, especially emotionally. Did you suffer any of that or, or how did you mitigate that to where you did not, if you did not? Yeah, I really do think being with the same group of girls in the dorm, like all the way through my childhood, we did talk a lot and we did confide in each other. And we had, we did have fun things happen in our lives. Like they were not as much as there was a lot of neglect going on, they would take us on field trips. They would take us to the zoo. Like we would have experiences of joy together and um, they would let us like listen to magazines or listen to, or the radio. Like there, it wasn't a total, um, there were moments of, of joy as anybody. And when you're a child too, you find what you can. And I do think that that's a big part of it. Like I had people I loved and they were my friends. And then I also really liked my parents. Like I believe they loved me too. And I didn't think they were doing anything wrong. And I had my brothers there, my older sister. I'm the youngest of four. So my brother, who's two and a half years older than me, was like the next over. We, he was, he would look out for me and like, we would like, we were really close and it was like, I looked up to my older brother and sister who I didn't see a lot because they're much older. Um, so you have these like points of like stability of like, that's my brother, that's my sister. You know, my parent, my parents aren't here, but they're working hard. And I think in a way you can make your brain be okay with that because you're just like, this is the way it is. And, um, you know, I'm lucky and I don't, rem I don't, or at least I don't recall ever having like my mouth washed down with soap or spankings, which was, which was happening when I was like five, six to seven, eight to people around me. And I don't know if, because my mom was a teacher too, there's maybe like the teacher rule of like, you know, leave my kid alone. I'll leave your kid alone or, or I blocked it out, but I don't remember it. Um, so I don't have that trauma. Although as I get older, things the the little like bubble I have becomes um you know thinner and thinner as I begin to see through into the outside world as I read more books and I watch movies and I begin to be questioned why like how come we don't have a normal family unit or you know mm -hmm. but that comes as I'm entering more into my teenage years okay were your siblings all of them born into the church or some of them um I know my brothers were born, they were all born into the church, but I think my parents joined the Sea Org like when my brothers, I, like after my brothers and my sister were born and then, so they joined the Sea Org and moved to LA and then they had me because I'm the only one born in Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Now, what about school? Did you go to a public school, private school? I mean, how did that work? Yeah. So what they did, they had their own school. I'm not sure if it was licensed or not. I should Google that. But it was called, the, the first one was a CEO, and it was in the parking lot of this place called the Celebrity Center. And that one I don't really remember. It was until it was about four or five. Um, and then from there, we went to a place called the ATA, and they did teach us how to read and write. But there were kids that would fall through the cracks because it was way too many kids to how many staff there were. Um, and luckily I was, I'm an avid reader. I, you know, some kids just come to it naturally. So I was able to read and write fine. I was a pretty smart student. Um, and then along with doing all of those, like reading, learning how to read and write, once you can read and write, and then you're also learning Scientology studies. So they had us do something called like the learning how to learn. And that's like, um, learning how Albert and Hubbard tells you how to learn things. It's like, don't pass any words you don't understand. And like, you need to make sure you demonstrate things with little pieces of like particles. And this is how they actually literally learn all the way through in Scientology as an adult. So you start learning that as a, at a young age um, and it becomes super important. Like anytime you do something bad, it's like, did you go past a word you didn't understand? Like they put a lot of emphasis on like understanding every single word. Um, so you're starting to do a lot of that at, at 
when at a very young age and you're learning words by like Chinese school, which is what they called when we would like chant words back. So it was words from, they had an actual dictionary of Scientology words that Alvin Hubbard had made. And we would learn like what the definition of backflash is. And backflash is like talking back basically, but you'd have to say it back verbatim, like the whole, all the kids screaming the definition back. And you do that every day, like a different word, the same word. So you're always learning these new Scientology words. It's like in your brain. Interesting. Now, one thing that struck me as you were describing this is like many things in life, and you Mm -hmm. pointed out, it wasn't all bad. And some of what you were describing seems like valuable lessons, like never skip a word you don't understand, Mm -hmm. would seem to be something you may want to teach your kids now because make sure you understand what you're doing, that that's valuable. So I, I want to always be fair and say, okay, well, not everything is terrible that's ever being taught. It sounds like there's some legitimate um, skill building that maybe they were teaching you at the same time. Oh, legitimately. Like, so a lot of people, when they enter Scientology, there are, Alvin Hubbard basically pulled all this in from like really good basic life skills like how to understand things properly. Don't go by words you don't understand. And then they do take it a little bit more intently at, in the CR. Like anytime you do something wrong, like on a job, they have you word clear everything is what they call the word, what you do. You have to go through your whole text and get a checkout. It's like very intense. But obviously to be able to understand something fully, that beginning basis is very helpful. And then like it goes from like at a young age, they do something called a locational, which is like when you're upset, you walk around and you look at things and everybody knows a walk and looking at things will calm you down. So that's like a helpful tool. And I used it all the time growing up. Um, So that's not even a bad thing. Um, But it's also something that people did anyway, like generally in life or a therapist might be like, you need to take a walk when you get upset. Um, so I do think there are a lot of life skills, like communication is another thing we studied at a very young age, which is where we would like learn how to be able to just sit still. And like, as a child, that's a hard thing to do, but we will learn how to do it. And then you learn how to communicate and how to acknowledge. And like, so a lot of me and my friends, even to this day, when we talk to people, they're always like, like, I think, especially when we are younger, we're very forthright and like, can just have a conversation. So it's like you do get some skills from it, um, but then they could take those same skills to the extreme where it's like sit for two hours and stare at someone, which you can kind of get into like a trance state or something. I've been reading as I've, I'm no longer a Scientologist, how these certain things that they're doing over and over can make it almost like a meditative state of mind. Yeah, there's um... a... You know, d- definitely. And there are some who claim that Charles Manson learned hypnosis from Scientology courses, believe it or not. But mm, that's another that's fascinating um, yeah. element. Well, it's something that you can read later, but it, it's some spooky things. But I, I did want to point that out and I want to address that. How how do you parse this information? And, and I'm asking you specifically because mm-hmm. you never knew anything else. So yeah. when when this is the only education you have the only information that you have you can't be held responsible for it so how how do you unwind this or is this a work in progress yeah um i am fully out of scientology and left most of like everything behind all of the stuff i learned um went out by the time i was 21 but there's this long process so when i'm um i call myself the bad cadet for the book title it's a sarcastic title because I'm never a bad cadet or a bad person. It's just, I'm a child. As I become older, they start to expect more and more from you. And so, you know, you have a job, it's called a post and you have to go when I'm sent to this ranch I talk about when I'm about eight years old. And now I don't, I only see my parents like once every five months, every six months. And it's, you're just you. And it's like your, your own independent self and you have a job and you have to go to your Scientology studies and you have to do um, regular school as well, a few hours of that. And that's, you have a regimented schedule and that's all you do. And for a while it's fine. But after a while, when I start to read books and I'm watching movies, I'm like, but this other world out there, they call it like the WOG world. And it's a derogatory term WOG that L. Ron Hubbard made up basically kind of just putting down the outside world. And it's like, 
but uh, to me, I'm starting to look through that bubble and I'm like, but that looks fun. Like they get to have weekends, they get to go to the movies, they get to go to the mall. And not to say like, every, like if every other week they would like take the bus, if you, if you worked hard and your stats, they call them stats were high enough, like you worked hard enough and you weren't in ethics trouble, meaning being bad, you got to go to the mall with your friends. That was every two weeks. And that could be like a really exciting thing, but you have to have, that didn't happen every two weeks because you had to have all these other things to get that. Um, so I, as I get older and I start to compare my world and the outside world, I start to struggle a lot and I start to question. But the thing is, that's interesting is I'm not questioning Scientology. I believe in that entirely. I'm just wanting to have my own independence. And that's where, because they control everything about me and about all my, with all my friends, this is what you're doing. This is how you work. And my parents too, like there are times when they are going to come visit me and I'm so excited and they call me and they say, sorry, my stats are down. So they had the same rules as we did. Your stats are down. Nope. You can't go see your kid. And that was like normal. And I was, and that was you know, you'll read, you'll see in the book, the slow unraveling where I start to want to just basically have my own independence. Right. Now you mentioned that you were super close knit with your friends, especially, you know, as a child and growing up, how many of those friends, you know, percentage or whatever, you don't have to give names. Are you still talking to, or did they all come out of the church with you or some number? That's a great question. So eventually a lot, we get just told, okay, you're going in the Sea Org and we all get told at different times. So the Sea Org is a whole different ball game. Now we're an adult, even though we're 14 or 15 and we're working regular jobs and we're no longer going to school except for on Saturday, unless they got you to get your GED. So a lot of us, let's put it this way. I would say there was about, in my time, about 200 kids at the ranch. And I, I'm going to guess like half left the Sea Org, so 100, mm. which is a high, high amount. But like they staggered. So I left really early. I left at 16 years old. Some, some of them were like 25 when they left, which is like way harder, I would say, to acclimate to the regular world. And then of those, I would say 25 of them are still actually Scientologists. And then another 25 are not Scientologists, but hide it because they don't want to lose their parents. And then I would say, yeah. And then um, me and my friends that I'm really close with and the others is like 25 of us who are vocal and have spoken out about Scientology or like things that we didn't. Um, and it's not even speaking. I was just talking about how we grew up. We still get attacked for it. And we get I'm like my parents were taken from me, meaning they chose. Well, they chose to not talk to me anymore five years ago because of a, my best friends were on Leah Remini's show and I wasn't even me, but I wasn't willing to disconnect from them. So they disconnected from me. Like that's how much control Scientology has. Um, but to answer your question, I would say like 50 of us are fully out, out and, and of the like 200 kids where we are no longer Scientologist and some of us are brave enough to talk about it. And, and some of us, it's like not about bravery. It's about like they want to keep their relationship with their family. And if mm -hmm. they say anything negative, their family will, and friends, even their job possibly, because a lot of them will work for a Scientology company or where sure. everybody's Scientologist, they will lose it all. So they have to be quiet. Wow. Okay. On that note, you mentioned you left the Sea Org at 16. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily leaving Scientology at 16 yeah. though, correct? Yeah, that's a great point. So um, the process of leaving actual Scientology and like the mind think of like everything you do has to be to clear the world or for this church and organization, that takes a lot longer to get out of. Um, it took me a few years, uh, let's say four or five. And that is something that I, actually, I wrote this book about growing up in the Sea Org because it is really fascinating. And like you said, there's so much to unpack. And at the Pack Ranch, it's what the ranch we were at. What was that really like? And if anybody really wants to get those type of details and a coming of age story, that's what that story is. And it's 
very light and actually people find themselves laughing sometimes, but then they're also sad because they get sad for me. This is just the feedback I've gotten. Um, it's, it's a very, I tried to be as realistic of how I felt in that time. So there are happy moments and there are sad moments and everything in between. When you leave the Sea Org, it's, it's a culture shock. And I tried to go to high school and I was like, this will be like the movies, not like the movies. <laughs> and I was very surprised. I went yeah, to a public high school, public high school. I went when I was 16, okay. I was way uh, behind on everything, math, especially. Um, and on top of it, it was a very overcrowded school underfunded because I went to stay with my mom's sister who I never met before an aunt in Florida. Okay. And the school was just an underfunded school in Tampa, Florida. So it was just chaotic, a lot of people. And I like made friends, but it wasn't the same as my close friends that I grew up with. So I dropped out after a semester. Did, did they know that you were a Scientologist? Yeah. And they didn't understand it really. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't as much out then, like, you know, on the internet and, sure. you know, it was early 2000s. Um, was your job though? I'm, I'm curious because some yeah. of these details I think are interesting. Yeah. When, when you were in um, the public high school, was part of your job to recruit people into Scientology or were you left alone? Like just go to school and try to get along. I was, um, they were just like, yeah, just go to school. My mom, I mean, my mom basically just dropped me off there and then went back to LA. And then I was just like, I, this isn't like what I expected. Cause I was expecting, you know, a really, I think a smaller school. Cause I was already in like only a 200 person school. And this was like a, upwards of a thousand to 2000. And, um, I grew up in a white environment and this school was like predominantly like Mexican, Puerto Rican, Dominican. And, and it was just interesting. I and I made friends with them too, but it was just like, not what I was used to. I listened to punk rock. I wore Dickies. I wore Converse. So I was just like, who are my friends here? And then anybody who dressed like that were all potheads. And I thought drugs were bad. <laughs> so at the time. Um, Unless you're L. Ron Hubbard. He liked them. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know of all that till way later. Sure, sure. I know. So that's my beginning. But all I wanted to do was get back with my friends because they were slowly tricking, trickling out of the Sea Org. And they were starting to hang mm -hmm. out in L.A. So eventually... I get back to LA and I managed to get a job. I'm supporting myself at 17 and I'm like living my best life. Cause I get to what kind of friends. Job? I actually start working at a place called Delphi Academy, which is a Scientology affiliated school that they won't list that it's implied scholastics, mm. but they use the study technology that I was talking about clearing your words and like demonstrating. Um, but you don't have to be a Scientologist to go there, but most kids who go there, their families are Scientologists. I see. So I got a job there easily as a librarian at first. And then after a few years, I was a teacher for what they called form three, which would be like a mix of grade three and grade four. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have my high school diploma, but you know, I was a Scientologist. So that counted, <laughs> which I'm being sarcastic. Like, I don't know how that was allowed, but um, I did. I mean, I was really good with the kids and they have what was called like check check sheets, which are like checklists mm -hmm. and they just follow them. And I help them understand their, their words and like make sure they are having a good time. And yeah, so I was doing that and then, but getting paid very little, but I was just happy because I had my own apartment. I had my freedom. I would go out with my friends on the weekends. We were underage, but we were like, you know, doing what underage kids do in LA and like smoking, smoking, drinking. So I was like a Scientologist because everybody hung out with was a Scientologist. But we didn't practice any Scientology. So that I guess was... not. If you were smoking and drinking, that's probably be yeah. like a Mormon kid who's um, you know going nuts on the town. Uh, very interesting. So what about it? So you're on your own effectively. You said you had your own apartment. You're 17. So you're not even technically an adult and sort of living as an adult. How did dating and things like that, you know, get into your life? Yeah. So I, um, very, I would, I like, I would date, I had like a Scientology boyfriend for a little bit and he was really nice. And then he moved to Florida and like, you know, would have little mess arounds with just not like full mess around, <laughs> but like, you know, kiss here and there at a party, you know, and it was fun. Mm -hmm. But after a while, when I was, by the time I was 20, I was like over that. And I started to date like actual non-Scientologists. Cause it's like the crowd is only so large 
of people we know. And they were all just friends, but like either good friends or I wasn't interested, you know? So, um, how does that work with the church? Because you're still in, mm -hmm. you're dating people who are not, are, are there certain rules or parameters, um, what you're allowed to do? It was more just, I'm only 20. I just want to meet people and have fun. And eventually I'll marry a Scientologist and we'll get married and have kids. And then I'll go on course and do really well. And then like Scientology was like something I would do when I was ready to grow up. Like it wasn't something I needed. And I would get to see my parents. I would just drive over to what's called the pack base, which is like on Fountain Avenue in Los Angeles. And I would have the morning with them and have brunch. And like, I, even though I was the youngest, I was kind of the most put together because I had like my car and, you know, mm -hmm. had a paycheck, although I was broke, but all the time. But how much um, of your paycheck did you have to donate back to the church? Because I hear that, mm -hmm. that it's very wealthy and it likes its members to put in a lot of money for training. Did, did you have to give a certain amount of your paychecks and whatever wages? So if you were actually what a real Scientologist, which I was like calling myself that, but I wasn't doing anything. And when you leave the Sea Org, they actually, it's ridiculous, but they tell you that you have to owe them for any courses you did while you were there. So when they put mm. me on the, what was called the EPF, which is like their training program, that EPF, which is like you do hard labor and then you study Scientology studies, cost me five grand and I had to pay it back. And I was 14 or 15 years old, um, which is pretty much probably illegal to do that. And I think they, so I never paid it though. Cause I was just like, as you could tell from me, I'm not a big rule follower. And I was just like, as long as I'm not talking out and eventually I'll pay it off when I have a lot of money, I just don't have a lot of money. I need to pay for my food, gas and going out with my friends. Like these are my priorities and my rent. Mm -hmm. Um, and like car insurance, forget about it. I couldn't even afford it. LA was so expensive. So I would get, so then I would get in like run-ins with the law because I would get pulled over and I didn't have car insurance. So I would have issues like that. Um, but I, like, I just, so yeah, I had no money to give firstly. And then, and I always was just like one day in the future, I will be more set up and then I will buy courses. That's where your money from your paycheck goes from or auditing. And it's really expensive. It can be like, if you got 12 hours of auditing, I think it's like $15,000. Like it's really, it's a cost a lot of money. Um, so, and then I'm going to, so to, to, so I'm just living this life and pretty happy, really happy, really. Cause I, again, it's that freedom of me being able to make my own choices and I just enjoy it so much. Even if I'm broke all the time, it doesn't matter. Um, eventually I meet my now husband, he's my boyfriend in LA and he, you know, was a college grad, graduated from Michigan, was living in LA to be a screenwriter and we hit it off, um, and I really enjoyed hanging out with him. We we're dating. And I was like, even though we're boyfriend and girlfriend, just know we're never going to get married. I would tell him that all the time. And I'm like, by this time, I'm 21. He's like, okay. Or I'm 20, about to be 21. And he's 24. He's like, yeah, we're, why are you even talking about marriage? Sure, Catherine. Like, probably great for him, right? No pressure. Yeah. He's like, hey, <laughs> okay. I, I will never pressure you into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we were just hanging out. And then, one day I get a phone call to get, go to the church to pack. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That's weird, but okay. And I, and to me, I take this as an opportunity to show them how great I'm doing. I'm like, I work at this Delphi, which is like basically all Scientology kids. And I'm doing a good job. I get caught what's called commendations where they write good things about you. So mm -hmm. I get all my commendations in a folder and I arrive and I get pulled into an office, the security office, which is like really scary. And I'm like, okay, well, here you guys, like I'm doing really good. And then this woman who I knew when I was in the Sea Org, she says that because my brother, I, had a, I have an, another older brother, was getting sick a lot and having to go to the hospital a lot. He was having, he had plastic anemia. He, they think he was sick because of me. Because- what? Yeah. And it's, and I was just like, what? And, and then they're like, and on top of it, your dad is also making mistakes on his post on his job, basically. And I, we also know that he's connected to you. So we think that they 
they shouldn't talk to you anymore. And if you say anything to them, you're going to get declared a suppressive person. And I'm just like, a suppressive person is like the worst thing in the world. Basically, you're excommunicated from the church. No one could talk to you, even all my friends. And Delphi would fire me, everything. So I just have to say, okay, I mean, I'm crying. I'm like, I can't believe you guys think this. Like, I'm, you're basically saying I'm evil. I'm not evil. Like, obviously, I can't cause my brother to be sick. They're like, well, you're connected to him. And that's that. So for like months, they don't talk to me, my parents and my sister and my brother. And my other brother is out, Jason. He left the CR, or so he's out in LA with me. So he's fine, but they're not talking to me. And I'm pretty upset about it, but I'm also like just trying to live my life. I'm just like, it'll get sorted out. They don't know what they're talking about, is like how I'm rationalizing it. How was your boyfriend um, during this time? Was he of help? So during, then he, this is where he was a big help because he said to me, he's like, hey, you seem a little sad. That's not like your normal self. Is anything going on? And I was like, oh, no, it's fine. I was trying to, because you don't say anything bad about Scientology. It's like very against the rules. My whole life, never say anything negative. There's never a say term for that, leave. right? Uh, like don't black PR Scientology. Don't no, matter. I thought there was a term like, um, I, I, I heard it in one of the interviews that like anytime that you represent to the outside, everything's yeah, hey, you have to okay. Be good PR, like good roads, good weather, that one. That's it. Yeah. That might be a good There's roads, so good many. weather. Good roads, good weather. So I was just like, and I want to, what if one day he did want to be a Scientologist? I don't want to ruin his chance for total freedom. Like I can't tell him these bad things, but mm -hmm. my, my boyfriend at the time was just like, listen, like, just so you know, I grew up Christian and I'm not, I'm never going to be a Scientologist. There's nothing against your religion. I just, it's not for me. So if something's happening, like you could talk to me, it's not going to change anything. And I was like, oh, okay, so I'm not going to stop his path up the bridge because because he's never going to do it. So then I told him what happened and he just listened and he didn't cut in or like give me his opinion. And I heard myself talking and I was like, oh, my God, that is so wild that I'm letting them just control my family like this. And I'm OK with it. Like I would just like totally fine. So, so explaining it to him or breaking it down um, helped you to separate because I, yeah. I can hear the cognitive dissonance in what you're describing, where you're very upset, everything is going wrong against you, but then you're saying, oh, but I can't ruin his opportunities to be in this wonderful thing that's currently destroying my life. Yeah. It, it is a, you know, very it's kind of like the doctor who tells you, you got to quit smoking as they're having a sm cigarette in the break area. Yes. It's, um, it was me hearing myself say it out loud, but then I still rationalized it for like saying it out loud was really good for me, but I kind of still rationalize it. Like it's just a couple bad seeds in the Sea Org. Like they're still mm. trying to do the better good, but then like there was cracks, you know, and then I started to How like. How did he react as you were? And I, I'm just, and th no, I think this totally is fine. the most important part of the conversation, believe it or not. Because yeah. How did he react? Did he just listen and just support you and, and let you talk it out? Or did he say anything that made any difference? I'm curious. He just listened and that's all I needed. And like, he knew if probably from like prior times that I always, anytime he said something slightly negative about Scientology, I defended it right away or I mm -hmm. put up a wall. So he just listened and I, and that's all I needed from him. And then I, as I'm talking about it, I'm still kind of defending the church saying like, Hey, it's just a few bad people in there. And he's like, okay, well, I really hope that they can call it like call it my 21st birthday pass. That was what had like made me sad. Cause they didn't call me on my birthday. Um, so he just list, that was the main point was like, he listened and he still was like, I was like, few months down, down the road. Hey, I want to go to the Scientology event. I want to show you the good part of it. Like, let's see, I showed you the bad side. Let me show you the good. So I took him to what was called the basics release event. It was in at PAC where I went to the Sea Org and cause I would still go to events to see my old cadet friends mainly and say hi and stuff. And I would get a lot of dirty looks, but I'd ignore them cause I was used to it. Cause I was now an ex Sea Org member, but I would still like, my friends would still kind of talk to me. And they're like, are you being out ethics in the wog world? Like joking. And I'm like, no, I promise. Like as a joke. But so I was like, it'll be fun. You'll see like my other friends that I grew up with that are still in. 
And then watching again, it's like when you're with somebody else, he's not in it. And I'm watching these videos because it's like um, it was recorded live in Clearwater, Florida, and then they stream it a few days later. And listening to David Miscavige, he's talking about these new books that they have, new releases, because Scientology is always putting out new books that that people have to buy, and they're expensive. And he's just saying, the books you were studying before are all messed up. There are so many errors. There's, he's like, you won't believe it. Like this editor, he's like making fun of this editor. I'm like, but we're the ones who produce the books. Like we literally, and part of the Sea Org, we make the books. Like. Sea Org members who are not getting paid, they get paid like $30 a week, made these books like 10 to 15 years ago, but he's acting like it's somebody else. And he's also saying everybody who read these books, who got a lot out of them, that like, nope, all wrong. You need to go buy these books now and redo them. And I was like, what a load of shit. (laughs) Couldn't believe it. I was just like, and I realized as I'm watching, I'm like, they do this all the time. Every few years, it's like a whole level that gets redone and everybody needs to do it again. It was such like, so like obviously a money thing. So then as I was like, I was like, oh, that was uh, not the event I wanted to take you to. I'm like, there's better ones, like humanitarian ones, like where they like go out, like the volunteer ministers and there's an earthquake and they like go and help people trying to tell them like that still. But as we're like walking out, people are jumping in front of us, Sea Org members, like my friends, some of them are my friends. Hey, Catherine, did you buy your basics yet? Cash or credit card, cash or credit card. And I was just like, I was just like, this is so embarrassing. I like hustled him out of there or he both like left. And as we're driving out in the car, the like two Sea Org members like jump in front of the car and, and they're like, did you get your basics yet? You can't leave without your basics. It's what they called the, like the stack of books. It was like, I think it was like a thousand dollars. It was ridiculous. Um, so it's like your your worldview. I'm just is getting reframed mm-hmm. at this moment. Like it probably would have seemed normal prior to this. Yeah, I'm like, oh, they but have to now get their it's stats like up. But now I'm right. like watching through my boyfriend's eyes how it's so ridiculous that they're not even treating us as people. They're treating us like as a credit card and and like. Once you pay that, they'd be off to the next person. Like it was so uh, eye opening. And then I was just like, okay. And then from there, I just started to like kind of go on the internet and like learn a little bit more. Now get scared because you're not supposed to see the bad stuff because then you can get like in huge trouble. What? what how? How? How does that work? I, I am curious um, when you say that because. Well, we're talking about the internet here, okay? Just go mm-hmm. on Twitter. If you want to get disturbed, go on Twitter for a while. Because yeah. you'll be like, well, what's this hashtag? Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why is that trending? That's weird. How, what training did they give you to prevent you from seeing anything negative? Would it be, if you see the word Scientology, automatically never never read, never look? Mm-hmm. What did they do? Yeah, so they would just, from the time we were little, we were always taught, told the media is wrong and evil and they try to make things like that 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 it's not the way it is so don't listen Mm -hmm. to the media don't read that stuff um newspapers anything that's negative about scientology it's a lie and made up and they're just trying to pull us down because and i think there's even like it went further like there was like this i think that they like believe that there's like this cologamer like six people who like control all the media in the world and they control the story and the narrative but you have you grow up with a big distrust of the media and anybody who talks negative about Scientology is obviously a bad person. Like they are not mm-hmm. telling the truth and they're trying to tear us down and they're a suppressive person. So for ex- ironically, two things can be true at once. The media <laughs> can be completely horrible yeah. and full of it. And Scientology could be a bad thing. Yeah. So I'm just pointing out that is one of those odd ones because I'm going, well, I don't really trust the media either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Totally. I mean, and right now, especially it's like you could just filter your media to only see what you want to see and hear. Um, And that's Mm -hmm. what Scientology does. They have it. So everybody is so well trained. And if you say something negative about Scientology to somebody like a friend, they will write you up, which is called a knowledge report, and you will get pulled into the ethics officer and you will be handled. And by handled, they'll make you pay for your own counseling to get rid of those any negative thoughts or a reason why you read something bad. So, okay, on that front, uh, mm-hmm. it's very North Korean, by the way. Yeah. From what I, 
it's been a while from my understanding with the Scientology, they do this as well, where they will ask you to audit yourself or self report everything that yeah. you did in a day. And then they go to your friend and compare notes. Like, did you actually report everything that your friend snitched about on you? Mm -hmm. it, 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 can you explain that or am I completely off? No, it's like, it's very like that. So actually, if you read 1984, have you read that by George Orwell? Yeah, it's been yeah. a while, but yes. It, I read that when I was about 21, 22, and I was just like, it's the Sea Org. Like, this is what, in Scientology, everything is monitored. It's like, there's security cameras everywhere, but on top of it, if you have negative thoughts, you need to report them. So like, there's oh, no, right. like you basically report on yourself, you report on your spouse. It's really sad. So you, you lose that close relationship. You can report on your child and say like, they're not following, you know, he's going out partying. He needs to get audited. Um, if you're in a CR, it's way worse because they, you have signed up voluntarily and they will like put you on sort of. You were born into I it. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't know how much no. voluntary it is. I thought you know, I was on. wanting to do it. Or I was like told it was time. I was like, oh my gosh, it's my purpose. And then I was like, and you'll read it in the book. But I, I quickly realized, oh, this is drudgery work. And I hate this. Um, like just like menial, like call these people all the time. I'm like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. So, but that whole like um, re writing reports on each other. There's a moment when I'm about 15 years old and I'm like standing at what's called a muster where we all line up. It's very military like how they run the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're like, we're doing an interrog on this person. An interrogatory is like the worst thing. It's like where they send out a paper. Everybody gets a piece of paper. It's called a golden rod because it's like a golden, golden yellow color. And it asks questions. Have you seen this person slacking off? Has this person said anything negative to you? Everybody writes every negative thing about you. And it was on me. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. And then I had to get like a, what was called a court of ethics. And like people sit around, grownups too, and tell me all the bad things and horrible things I've been doing. And that's that's their ethics. Like that's how they handle people and instill fear in you because you don't want to get a court of ethics. You don't want to have an interrog put on you. And if you're whole world is your parent your whole family's in Scientology all of your friends are in Scientology who can you talk to no one so you keep it to yourself and then you also report if any of them say anything negative because you gotta keep it's like it's like a very catch-22 they're all reporting did you, on did, you it, did you and your friends close friends have any kind of um, arrangement where you might not report as thoroughly you kind of had understanding that Okay. Yeah. So I had like friends I knew would not report me and like they knew I wouldn't report them. Um, like my brother, for example, when we were at the ranch, like him and his friends were stealing quarters from like the laundry machine down at the church. There's like all these laundry machines where I did the laundry and he told me about it and I was like, oh, cool. And like never occurred to me to report him. And then they all get in trouble. And then somebody else told them that I knew, I don't know who, I don't mm. think it was my brother. So then I got in trouble. So you also get in trouble if you're an accessory to a crime. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, it's a big snitching culture and it's really, but they feel like they're doing the right thing. You know, mm -hmm. like when they tell on someone, like I'm going to help them get handled and they're going to be a better person for it. And then like six months later, now they're having bad thoughts or they do something bad and then somebody reports them. And it's just like this full circle. Does that ultimately implode? And and what I mean is these policies, you seem like you might be an occasional rebel. I might be wrong. But no, there, I am. <laughs> yeah. It seems to be a little streak in there. Could it be said that these policies may push you to the point when you're saying, if I'm such a bad person and they call me that anyway, well, the hell with it. I'm going to go the rest of the way there and I will own this label. Mm -hmm. Is that what ultimately maybe happened with you? Yeah. Especially when I was 14 and 15, I was so loud. I would dance around. I would laugh really loud. I was super like, and people would give me orders. I would kind of be like, you know, a teenager back, a little like snarky and stuff. And I would always just get in trouble. And I was like, fine. I just, I guess I just won't 
be in ethics and like, and not, and like not listen. And then as you get older, it changes. Um, I think because I never fully embraced being in ethics or even in the Sea Org did any actual auditing or anything that people get wins from wins. <laughs> I don't know. Um, they, I never, once I started to get those cracks from like seeing how much they want money and then where my family was taken from me, that was when I started to be like, is this even for me? And that's how I started to like break out for my friends. It took them, some of them took a lot longer and I couldn't talk to them about it because I didn't want to lose them. And then for example, one of my really like best, best friends, uh, she was in my wedding as well as the other two that were on Leah Remini show. So Leah Remini show hadn't happened. I got married. They were all my I had like six bridesmaids of child, of cadets who I'd grown up with. And we were all out except for this one of my good friends. And in the book, um, anyway, but she, I, I don't want to say her name because I try to respect privacy in that way. But she and I were really, really close. And then two of my other friends who were my wedding chose to go on Leah Remini's show because they had suffered some abuses, unfortunately. One was sexually abused. They were both sexually abused and it was covered up in some ways by the church. So they wanted to talk about it. She called me pretending, I'm pretty sure later I realized to find out if they're going on the show. And I was like, oh, she wants to have a, finally have like a real conversation because I would never really talk about Scientology with her. We, she would visit me in Minnesota, I'd visit her in LA. And we were good. And then when we were talking, I, she was like, so were your two friends, our two friends, were they paid to be on the show? And I was like, no, like they just want to talk about what happened. She's like, well, were they given special treatment? And I, and then I realized I was like, oh, like she's calling on the church's behalf to get information to like negate why they're on the show or say they, they're getting paid or they don't, what they're saying is false. I was, I'm like, you understand that my parent, if you say this and report this, that my parents will no longer talk to me and like, they'll feel like they can't talk to me. I'm like, please don't do anything. She's like, I'll I'll have to think about it. Or like, no, it's fine. I'm like, I'm like, okay, like we're still good. Right. Like I, they just want to talk about the truth. Like, it's okay. The church can just own that. Say they're sorry. It's not like it's like the end of the world for people to say this happened to me. And you say, oh, I'm wrong. I apologize. And I will be better for it. I'm like, there's a way that this could be a good thing. And she like, kind of like was like, yeah, yeah. And then like got off the phone and then like blocked me, unfollowed me on social medias. And then like a few weeks later, my sister called and said that her and my mom and my dad will no longer just were really upset that I knew about my friends and that I hadn't told on them and that they wanted a break. And I think they're saying want a break instead of disconnect because it just sounds more light. Um, and then I didn't and hear you have from not, them. And you've been separated from them now for years. Yeah. And like I had t- three children and my I had baby twins. They're only a, a little under a year old when this happened and a three-year-old. And they had come to visit every year from LA for like a week or two. And they loved my kids. So like mm-hmm. for them to also shun them out of this was just <clears throat> the saddest thing. And the worst part, I was like, I didn't even do anything. Like they're allowed to speak their truth. So then I was like, okay, well, after sitting on it and like I went and got a therapist because it was depressing (laughs) and good. Yeah. And just talked about it. And she was just like, it was good to hear again. Like when you talk it out loud, it really just helps to process everything. And eventually I was like, well, I had this book I had been working on. I had journaled on growing up and I was very aware of this how our world wasn't really matching up with the real world. And I was mm-hmm. like, I think I'm going to, I had always kind of wanted to write the book, but I couldn't because of my parents and I didn't want to lose them. Sure. So this is the thing that you're talking about where it's like, don't they kind of mess things up for themselves? The church. It's like, mm-hmm. when you take away my family, you've taken the one thing. You don't thing, have anything left. Yeah. You've taken away the one thing that I was, I was protecting the church because you had my parents. And then I was like, and I'm not even, this book isn't even an attack on Scientology. It's just an an account of how I grew up, but they probably, well, they will take it as an attack because that they don't want you to say anything that would be conceived in a negative light. And the fact of the matter is our parents didn't raise us and we were treated like little adults doing things that were highly inappropriate, like working hard and out in the fields or like 
climbing in dumpsters to clean them because we were being naughty, like stuff like that. I'm curious, mm -hmm. and this is maybe me projecting upon you. Um, did you possibly partly write the book as a communication to your family in the sense of this is who I am, this is what I'm about, and maybe have the hopes that someday that they can read that in their own time? Yeah, it's a great question. I read the, I wrote this book for the ranchers. It's dedicated to the ranchers, which is what we called ourselves the cadets, um, because um, I wanted a piece of our world captured that was like, it was such a strange time and it's never going to, it's not going to be duplicated because they closed mm -hmm. down all the ranches in the early 2000s. Um, and I definitely was like, it would be really cool if my mom and dad read it and my sister because maybe it would be different to read it in my voice. So I hope mm -hmm. that they do. I just don't know. Like they are so protected from reading anything negative and they choose not to. They actively choose right. not to. Have you mailed it to them? I have not, but I did. So somebody, because of me speaking out, somebody who was in the Sea Org just recently got out, reached out and told somebody else who contacted me that they had the number of where my parents were. So I was actually able to call and I talked and I had a conversation and they were just like, acted like everything was normal and fine that we hadn't talked in five years. And then I was just, it was really good to talk to them. They seem like they're doing okay. It's hard to know because they get, they have to put up a, uh, like say everything's great, but they sounded okay. And then I hung up and then I was like, I need a, I need to actually call back and tell my mom about the book because they're going to report this conversation to the ethics officer. And, um, and I don't know if I'll be able to talk to him again. So I called and I was like, mom, I wrote a book. It's called the bad cadet. And she was like, Oh my God, like start coughing. And I'm like, she's like, is it attacking Scientology? And I was like, I don't think so. I think it's a story of my childhood and how I always struggled in the sea org. You know how I was, I was always out ethics. And she's like, okay, okay. But she was like kind of subdued. And I was like, but mom, like my door is always open. You can always come and like, I love you. And like, even if, we don't see eye to eye on everything. Like we can be together and see each other. And she's like, I know. Okay, well, we'll see. Cause she said she had to check with the ethics officer on my earlier conversation to see if she could see me again. And she's like, are you still connected to your friends that were like on that show? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like we could still see each other. So, but then, so that happened. And then I tried to call the next day and the phone was disconnected. So I'm like, okay, I had that conversation. She knows about it. Um, we're talking, there's just like, yeah, I have to figure it out. I'm, t I'm talking to people and trying to see what's the best route here. Cause they're basically when you have like therapy kind of that's helping. Huh? And you're, you're seeking therapy, which probably would be helpful to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw my therapist yeah. like a week or two later and just told her about everything that's going on and it's been strange to be so vulnerable and like i've kept this i did not talk about negative about scientology up until this point when this book came out so this is all very like sure. and it's not even again like i'm not trying to be negative i'm just trying to be truthful and honest that you guys the church of scientology has taken my family from the beginning since i was a child and has made scientology more important than me and that's the case with all yeah. of my cadets so many of my cadet friends have lost their parents all because they are best friends with another friend who said something on Facebook that was against Scientology. And all because they were friends, they lost their parents. Like that's how much control is happening for all of the cadets, for all of their families. And then I have other friends who DM me and say, hey, I can't like your page or anything publicly because I can't lose my parents. But I think it's so cool what you're doing. And I'm like, it's so like, isn't that the saddest thing that this church has muffled people? And has made it but so they're you can't still have a getting dialogue. it though. Hmm? But they're still getting it though. So it, yeah. in a way, it is both depressing, but it's also encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, things don't change overnight. They tend to implode. One of my favorite quotations is a Hemingway quote, but it was, "How did you become bankrupt?" And the answer is, "Slowly at first. And then suddenly, <laughs> and if you have people who are reaching out in DMs and you have people that are getting the message, while it 
can be frustrating that you're public, you're talking, you're still communicating. Mm -hmm. And that means that they are potentially communicating as well internally and the overall weight in my opinion will collapse upon itself yeah i mean i hope that something happens where they at least give them some more freedom i mean if they just did that that would help so much like the church Mm -hmm. it's like loosen everything up let people have family i don't know if that's possible um, with who leads the church and everything like that. But like maybe it just happened in other churches. Yeah. They, they eventually, you know, like they, I hate to say go mainstream, but sometimes when the key figure disappears in order to stay alive, they have to change. Like um, I believe the Mormons had three or four, you know, they had multiple reformations um, through their time. And, I think anything's possible. And I, I yeah. just, I mean, I hope uh, so. I mean, that I think that I wrote this book to shed some light on what it's really like, why people believe so much and what it's mm-hmm. like to grow up in it. Um, I, I intend to write a second book of how I came out of Scientology itself and, okay. and what that was like. Um, but again, it's not done to be like, uh, I mean, I do want change in the church and I hope that they can be better, but I'm not trying to be mean. Like, I feel like sometimes a little guilty for my parents because, you know, for them to know that I'm doing this might hurt. But at the same time, I'm like, it's not okay that they have this power on any Scientologist that they can't speak their truth or talk about how it was when they were there when it's all true. If, if you could draft one statement to those who are in the church still, Mm -hmm. what would that be? I would say, Hey guys, don't you want to have freedom to talk to whoever you want to, whenever you want to, and not worry about being written up (laughs) and getting in trouble for it. That's freedom when you can't, when you can do what you want and talk to who you want to. It's just talking. Well, thank you. Why can't you have dialogue? (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. And thank you for talking to me. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me and giving this. Of course. And the book is um, Bad Cadet. And after I post these, are you open for people to reach out to you that maybe wish Mm -hmm. that are in the church or have been formerly in the church? Are you open for communication from those books? And that's where, like, I have the Bad Cadet Instagram. If you DM me there, I will respond. Um, You can follow me there or on Twitter either. And I've been trying to be responsive there. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, There is a link to the book in the description. I encourage everyone to definitely check that out. And hopefully I get to talk to you when the next book comes. Thank you. Oh, and an Audible will be coming out in, like, a couple months, if anybody's more of a fan of that. Yeah.